So how many of you have either experienced uh, diverticular disease or know of diverticular disease? Okay. So I think a good 60-70% of you. Um, this is the outline of my talk. So I'll be talking about some of the definitions um, because sometimes it can be confusing in terms of what's the difference between a diverticulum, diverticulosis, diverticulitis. Um, so I'll talk about that. Then I'll talk about the prevalence, risks, clinical features of uh, diverticulosis. Um, and then I'll go on to talk about some of the complications of diverticular disease, which includes diverticular bleeding as well as uh, infection, uh, which is called diverticulitis. And then I'll talk about um, the diet, um, so what's recommended in terms of diet and how we can prevent uh, diverticulosis. So I'll start again by going over the definitions. So um, many people have small um, pouches in the lining of the colon, um, and a single sac is actually called a diverticulum. Um, and then when patients have multiple sacs, it's called diverticula. Um, and then um, diverticulosis is a condition which, is, which basically describes a patient who has uh, multiple sacs or diverticula. And then diverticular disease includes when patients either develop bleeding within a diverticulum or if uh, patients get infection, which is called diverticulitis. So again, diverticulosis is having the disease or having multiple pockets. Diverticulitis is having uh, an infection. The prevalence of diverticulosis um, is about 20% um, at 40 years of age. So 20% of our population has uh, diverticulosis at 40 years of age. And then it actually increases to 60%. So more than half of all patients at 60 years of age have some diverticulosis. It's more common in westernized nations. Um, so countries like the US, uh, England, Australia, it's very common. Um, it's actually rare in um, Asia and Africa. So I'll, I'll be, so the question is from the audience, why is um, diverticulosis more common in uh, westernized nations? And so I'll be coming to that um, later on in the talk, and it's mostly diet related. Um, so basically diverticula develop at well-defined points of weakness, uh, which correspond to where the vasa recta penetrates the circular muscle in the layer of the colon. Um, and it's hypothesized that increase in intraluminal pressure predisposes to the formation of uh, the pockets. So this is just a picture of um, your colon. Uh, this is a picture of the colon. And um, so this is the beginning of the colon curves around, this is the ascending colon, this is a transverse colon, descending colon, sigmoid colon, and then the rectum. Diverticulosis is most common in the sigmoid colon itself, but can occur anywhere throughout the colon. So here are some risk factors of diverticulosis, and they include a diet that's low in fiber, that's a main risk factor. Um, also, a uh, diet that's high uh, that in fat and high in red meat um, also increases the risk of diverticulosis, and I think that's the main reason why it's more common in westernized nations. Um, and then other risk factors include lack of physical uh, exercise, constipation, uh, obesity, and uh, smoking. And actually, diverticulosis was very rare until the early 1900s when um, we started increasing the consumption of pro uh, processed meat in our diet. So 
uh, signs and symptoms of diverticulosis. Um, most patients who have diverticulosis without <coughs> developing any of the complications, so these are patients who just have the pockets. Um, most patients do not have any s signs or symptoms and it's often found incidentally during uh, colonoscopy. So you have your colonoscopy um, for screening purposes and your doctor tells you that you have uh, diverticulosis. That's the most common. Um, some patients who have diverticulosis without having an actual episode of diverticulitis m may have some abdominal discomfort, dis usually described as crampy pain. Uh, some patients have bloating and some patients have constipation. So now I, I was going to talk about diverticular disease, which includes diverticular bleeding and diverticulitis. So here's some pictures showing, this is diverticulosis where you can see this is a normal colon and then here are the pockets which form, which are sac-like protrusions that you can see. And then this is diverticulitis where these pockets get infected and then the patients can also have diverticular bleeding. So first I'll talk about um, diverticular bleeding. So diverticular bleeding is actually a rare complication of uh, diverticulosis. Um, it is the most common cause of massive uh, lower gastrointestinal hemorrhage. Um, and what happens is there's a small blood vessel within the diverticulum or within the sac that often ruptures and causes a large amount of bleeding. Um, and if patients have uh, bleeding from diverticulosis within the left colon, they usually have, their, their complaint is um, passing bright red blood. And it, usually the history is that they've had several episodes, including passing clots. Um, Sometimes patients can have diverticular bleeding from the right colon. Then by the time the blood reaches the end, it darkens. So they may complain of dark or maroon colored stool. So how do we diagnose di uh, diverticular bleed? Usually when patients present to the hospital with massive uh, lower gastrointestinal bleeding, we would like to perform a colonoscopy. And the reason why that is, is because there could be several causes of uh, lower GI bleed. And so a colonoscopy helps um, make the diagnosis because not all patients with lower GI bleed have diverticulosis. It could be from cancer, it could be from other causes. Um, so in the ideal situation, we would like to do a colonoscopy. And a colonoscopy, um, it cannot be done right away when a patient reaches a hospital because the colon needs to be prepped. So usually we'd like to do a colonoscopy in, within 12 to 24 hours of presentation. Um, now colonoscopy, how many of you here have had a colonoscopy? Okay, so I think 90% of the um, people in the room have had a colonoscopy. So essentially the procedure involves passing a tube. It's a flexible tube. Um, pass, we pass it up the rectum and advance it all the way to the beginning of the colon. The um, tube has a camera at the end of it, a light source, and then a channel for instrumentation and another channel for irrigation. Um, so um, again, the colonoscopy helps us outline the cause of the bleeding. Um, and the drawback of colonoscopy is that it, one needs to prep for the colonoscopy. Um, and then with, when patients do present with uh, diverticular bleeding, 80% of patients stop on their own, stop bleeding on their own. Um, in 20% of patients, they continue to bleed and we actually have to take measures to stop the bleeding. And if, um, again, measures to stop bleeding include colonoscopy, which I'll come to 
the different measure, measures we take during colonoscopy to stop bleeding. Uh, angiography is another method that we use to stop bleeding. And then if some of these measures, which are considered not so invasive, um, do not work, then we often do surgery. So this is a video. Um, let's see if it plays. So basically, this is a colonoscopy in a patient um, um, who had a diverticular bleed. And as you can see, there's the, there are the little pockets. And this is actually within a sac. And this is a clot overlying a blood vessel. And during the procedure, we wash away the clot. Um, and then this can be treated. In this particular case, this has already stopped bleeding. Now, different measures that we can take to control bleeding during colonoscopy, if we do actually see active bleeding. Um, one is we can apply cautery. So this is an example where we pass an instrument through the uh, endoscope, and we can treat the bleeding area by using cautery. Another method is we can um, inject medication. Usually, we inject epinephrine. Um, to stop bleeding. And another measure is we can place clips, such as a clip that you can see here um, over the blood vessel that's bleeding. Now, oftentimes we do colonoscopy and either we don't find the exact site of bleeding or um, other times are where patients um, are unstable to wait the 12 to 24 hours that it takes to prep a patient, and they're bleeding massively. So in those cases, we need to do angiography to control um, bleeding. So what's done is um, the physician or the radiology tech injects dye into the veins, and then we look for base, then we do a scan of the abdomen with a CT scan and to look for the site of bleeding. And in, this is an image that actually shows a normal angiogram, but you could see the site of bleeding right here. And then what, what they do is they um, embolize the artery, which means intentionally clot the artery, um, either that or insert a coil within the artery. And this patient had a coil, coil embolization, and the bleeding stopped. So again, if conservative measures such as colonoscopy or um, angiography do not control bleeding, then surgery is often needed. So what's do done during surgery is the segment that's believed to be affected is removed. And then once that's removed, then they connect the healthy segments to each other. So now coming to uh, diverticulitis, which is an infection of a diverticulum or inflammation. Diverticulitis occurs in about 10 to 25 percent of patients with diverticulosis. Um, there's approximately 2.2 million cases per year. Um, risk factors of diverticulosis I already discussed, but in patients who have diverticulosis, what are certain risk factors that can predispose to uh, diverticulitis? These include uh, ingestion of aspirin or non-steroidal uh, anti-inflammatory medications, which include medications like Advil or Aleve. Um, increasing age is another risk factor. Obesity and lack of uh, exercise are other risk factors. So what are uh, clinical features that patients present that have inflammation or infection? Um, most common symptom is um, abdominal pain. So patients generally have abdominal pain in the left lower quadrant, which is the left lower abdomen. Um, and the pain is often described as either crampy type of pain or sharp, sometimes stabbing type of pain. 
patients may have nausea or vomiting. Um, and then because it is an infection, patients can have fevers or chills as well. And then when the doctor examines you, they'll, um, you'll experience tenderness when they palpate the left lower abdomen. So it, there are some conditions that um, mimic diverticulitis or may present in a similar fashion to diverticulitis, and these include uh, appendicitis, bowel obstruction, uh, sometimes gastroenteritis can present in a similar way. Colorectal cancer, especially if it's causing obstruction, can cause pain. Uh, inflammatory bowel disease, ischemic colitis, uh, ovarian torsion can present, uh, pancreatitis, <clears throat> and sometimes uh, urinary tract infections. So how do we make the diagnosis when a patient does present with the typical symptoms? Um, we uh, do some blood work initially, so oftentimes we'll order um, blood counts, we'll do a CBC, which is a complete blood profile, and you'll see uh, leukocytosis, which means an elevation in the white blood cell count, which is usually elevated during infection, and that's seen in 55% of patients. Um, we'll just get your general basic metabolic panel generally to assess the electrolytes and the kidney function. Oftentimes that your doctor would do a urine analysis to make sure you're not having a urinary tract infection. Um, and then a C-reactive protein, which helps us determine if there's inflammation in your body. And then, um, then the diagnosis is actually made by imaging of the abdomen. So there's various imaging modalities that we often use. Um, so t CT scan is a non-invasive x-ray that produces cross-sectional images of the body. Um, and so basically, it's a donut-shaped machine. Um, and to better take a look at your inside structures, you often get a dye through the vein um, and also uh, we, for, to look at, uh, I mean, to take a good look at the gastrointestinal tract, we often ask patients to take uh, oral contrast as well. Another imaging modality that we use is uh, ultrasound. Um, so an ultrasound basically through this probe um, generates sound waves um, that are sent uh, towards a colon. Um, and the echoes create a picture called a sonogram. Um, and other modalities include MRI and a contrast um, enema, usually with barium. Uh, but generally the study that's preferred is a uh, CT scan. MRI is also good, but it's more time consuming. If a test is needed on a more urgent basis, a CT scan is done. So how do you treat uh, diverticulitis? <clears throat> a lot of patients present to their doctor's office as an outpatient, and it can be treated um, on an outpatient basis if a um, patient's not that sick. Um, so generally, we treat with antibiotics, um, and we usually use a combination of uh, something that would cover gram-negative organisms, so good um, Antibiotic for this is an antibiotic called ciprofloxacin, which is a fluoroquinolone, or levofloxacin. And this is often combined with metronidazole, which covers uh, anaerobic bacteria. Um, and then we often advise bed rest, we give pain relief, and then initially, just because of all the inflammation, we recommend a liquid diet until the symptoms improve, and then the diet's advanced slowly to a soft diet and then eventually a high fiber diet. Um, severe cases may need hospitalization. Um, patients may need IV fluids, IV antibiotics. Um, and if you end up getting hospitalized for diverticulitis, oftentimes we don't allow patients to eat, um, um, just to allow things to heal, allow the bowel to rest. And surgery is often needed in severe cases. Yes. 
Oh, it, it just is another word uh, for, or abbreviation for nil per oral, which means nothing by mouth. So um, after treatment, um, what is a recommendation? Um, during an acute episode of diverticulitis, colonoscopy is contraindicated. Um, because if you insert a scope during that when there's so much inflammation, there's risk of perforation of the bowel. But a colonoscopy is recommended by most experts um, in four to six weeks after an episode of diverticulitis. Um, and the reason for doing this is just to make sure there's not anything else present in your colon that may have caused um, you know, the symptoms such as colorectal cancer. There are some patients who have recurrent diverticulitis. This occurs in about 9 to 36% of patients with diverticulitis. Um, surgery is often recommended in these individuals. Usually the general rule we follow is if patients have had three episodes of diverticulitis or more, then we recommend removing that segment of colon that's affected. Um, and if there are complications that I'll come into, then we recommend doing surgery earlier. So there are several complications of um, diverticulitis, uh, some of which include uh, abscess, um, perforation. So abscess is basically a pus collection within the abdomen. Um, sometimes a pocket could burst, which is called a perforation. Um, peritonitis, which occurs once a pocket bursts, and then the pus sort of spreads to your peritoneum, which is a lining of the intestines outside, and that's per called peritonitis. Sometimes you could have fistula formation, which is a connection between your large intestine and adjacent st uh, structures. So that's another complication. Sometimes the inflammation is so severe that it can cause intestinal obstruction. So that's another complication. Um, show you some images. So this is an this is a cross section of your abdomen on CT scan, and over here you can see. Uh, so this is your normal bowel, and here you could see an abnormal fluid collection or collection of pus, because the diverticulum actually burst. And then this is just a picture of a fistula formation. So this is a sigmoid colon, which is a part of the colon on the left lower abdomen. And this, there's a fistula or a connection between the sigmoid colon and the bladder, the urinary bladder. So fistula can form between your colon and the skin, which is referred to an, as an intercutaneous fistula, or between the bladder, as you can see here. Other structures include the small intestine, um, could also make a connection to the uterus. And then um, treatment of, say, an abscess, if, if you do develop a um, pus collection within the abdomen due to a diverticulitis, um, oftentimes what we do is we ask the radiologist who do a either CT guided or an ultrasound guided drainage. So this patient is having a drainage of the abscess with a needle and a syringe. Um, and basically they go, here this is just a image of another pus collection and they would go through the anterior abdominal wall as you see in this patient and put the needle within the pus collection and uh, remove the pus. Um, and then oftentimes surgery, again, may, need, may be needed for diverticulitis. And again, what's done is they remove the abnormal segment of bowel, which is called a segmental resection. Um, sometimes they'll actually, if there's an extensive area of involvement, they may do a hemicolectomy, which is removing your half of your colon, so either a left hemicolectomy or if it's involved 
on the right side a right hem hemicolectomy. And if the inflammation is very severe, um, they could do a colostomy, which is generally temporary because your bowel is too um, diseased to be connected together right away. And if this is done, then uh, surgeons will leave the colostomy bag there for anywhere from six weeks to sometimes three months. And then when the patient's much healthy, then they'll connect the bowel back together. So I just wanted to ask all of you a question. Um, you have a friend who has a family history of diverticulosis <coughs> who's worried about developing diverticulosis himself. And what do you recommend is in, in terms of the daily fiber intake that he should consume to reduce the chances of developing diverticulosis? So do you recommend five grams per day, 15 grams per day, 25 grams per day, or 40 <coughs> grams per day. So how many of you say five per day? How many of you say 15? Okay, a couple of you. And how many of you say 25? Okay, a lot of you say, and 40? Okay, good. So the right answer would be, C would be an appropriate answer. I guess D, more fiber should not hurt. So the recommendation is to take 20 to 35 grams of fiber per day. So prevention of uh, diverticulosis, again, as I mentioned, um, fiber in terms of fruits, vegetables, and grains. The different types of fiber include <coughs> soluble fiber. This is a type of fiber which dissolves easily in water. And examples include uh, oatmeal, nuts, beans, apples, uh, br uh, blueberries. Then insoluble fiber passes almost unchanged. Um, and examples include seeds and skins of fruit um, and whole wheat bread, uh, brown rice are other examples. Uh, again, 20 to 35 grams are recommended per day. Um, Physical exercise, weight loss in obese pa patients is suggested, and then smoking cessation is suggested in uh, smokers. So another question. Um, another friend has known diverticulosis, um, and he, has, he asks you about the role of nuts, corn, popcorn, and seeds in diverticulosis. Um, so what do you counsel your friend? Do you tell them, how many of you think that um, you should tell them to avoid nuts, corn, popcorn, seeds completely? How many of you suggest that moderation is okay? And how many of you suggest that there's no restriction? Okay, so no one answered no restriction. And actually the correct answer is no restriction. So, um, <laughs> Yes. Years ago, I was told Yes, so the comment is, has that changed? Um, so, yeah, traditionally we have been advising patients to avoid nuts, seeds, popcorn, um, but there's no scientific data <laughs> behind that. And the thought is that sometimes the seeds or popcorn can get stuck. Uh, in the diverticular uh, pocket, but um, there hasn't been any scientific literature to support that. And then, <laughs> so there's, there was a large study um, in 2008 that was published in um, JAMA, and they looked at 801 cases of diverticulitis and 383 cases of diverticular bleeding. And then they took a history um, and they looked at the consumption of corn and popcorn. Uh, and 15% of patients consumed uh, them at least twice a week. Um, and in this study, nut, corn, and popcorn consumption was not associated with an increased risk of complicated diverticular disease. Um, and here's some of the data. Um, 
so again, for nuts, there was no increase in the risk the, uh, when they compared patients who did not com uh, consume nuts, whereas those that consume nuts. Same trend was observed for corn, and then same for popcorn. Um, so, so the question is, what about seeds? Um, so this study did not look at seeds in particular, so that's a good question. But there hasn't been any scientific evidence to support seeds. Um, and so coming to the management of constipation, is constipation um, can predispose to um, diverticulosis, as it's thought that straining, when you strain, that in actually increases the uh, pressure within the colon that predisposes to um, formation of the pockets or the sacs. Um, so there's different, um, again, fiber is used to treat constipation, and then different laxatives can be used. Um, there's bulk forming laxatives, which include um, Metamucil, Citrusel, Fibercon, and Benefiber, um, and some of these are good. There's osmotic laxatives as well. In examples include uh, Miralax and Lactulose, and these are generally safe to take. Um, patients can take these long term. Then there's stimulant laxatives, which include example is Senna, stool softeners, Colase, and others, uh, some of the newer agents like uh, Lubiprostone and Linactolide. Um, wanted to discuss just some steps that you can take to better digestion. Um, so one is to drink plenty of fluids. Um, basically, um, fluids help with constipation. Um, and um, liquids with fiber help to bulk up and soften stools. I think you should avoid um, certain drinks with too much caffeine, such as soda, uh, coffee, or tea. I think a healthy diet that we've discussed. Um, yes. Sure. Thank you. Yes. So again, eat healthy. I think. I drink only the caffeinated coffee and very rarely. Okay. And only herbal too. Okay. So the comment is drinking caf uh, decaf coffee as well as herbal teas. So. I think that's, that's fine because uh, herbal teas don't have much caffeine and decaf coffee, yeah. And decaf coffee is, is fine as well. Can you Another. One more? I didn't see what to avoid. Just oh. essentially just caffeine. Oh. Yeah. Oh. Too much caffeine. Um, the question is how much water should one strive to consume per day? So generally the recommendation is about two liters per day, unless your doctor recommends restricting fluid for any reason. Say that again. About, um, which is about um, eight glasses per day. Yeah, about 60 ounces. So eat healthy, and that's again, small portion sizes, especially in patients that are obese, limit fatty and fried foods, fiber in your diet that we talked about, plenty of uh, fruits and vegetables, probiotics and prebiotics. Um, prebiotics are non-digestible food ingredients that stimulate uh, growth and are activity in, of bacteria in the gut. Um, and there's a lot of pre uh, prebiotics in, in vegetables, basically, like salad, uh, greens, um, exercise is recommended, which helps with circulation of the gastrointestinal tract. Um, also, obviously, it helps maintain a healthy weight. And then, um, I think seeing your doctor regularly is, a good, is always good for your health. Um, report any changes or unusual symptoms. Regular screening um, is recommended for in terms of gastrointestinal health. Screening colonoscopy at, after the age of 50 is recommended um, earlier if there's a family history of uh, colon cancer. Um, 
And then when should you alert your doctor if you do have a history of diverticulosis? Um, is if you have any abdominal pain that's unusual, especially in the left lower, um, any fevers, chills, any nausea, vomiting. Excuse me on the chills. Mm -hmm. I get a chill maybe twice a week. Mm -hmm. Should I call my doctor? No, I mean it's a constant. Yes, I mean it's a constellation of. If obviously if you had fevers and chills, mm -hmm. then then you should call call your physician. And then rectal bleeding. For any rectal bleeding, one should seek uh, medical attention. And with diverticular bleeding, it's usually massive bleeding that will occur. Um, and then you should seek medical attention. So um, that'll be the end of the talk. Any questions? Can I take any more questions? Yes. Uh, So the question is, when a patient does have diverticulitis, an episode, how long should you stay on a, a liquid diet? So first of all, if you do have an episode of diverticulitis, I think you should see a physician <coughs> and follow their direction. And then it usually depends on the symptoms, um, how severe that, and, and how the severity of the episode of diverticulitis. So if it's a mild episode, being on a liquid diet for a day or two is fine. Um, but it, I, I would more gear it on an individual basis. Depends on the patient. So if, um, and also depends on your symptoms. So if you feel better after two or three ta days of taking antibiotics, then you could resume a soft diet and advance to a, a regular diet. Um, and then in more severe cases where you, you're continuing to have lots of abdominal pain, you ha don't respond to antibiotics, and you may need to be on liquids for longer. Could you sit back to that uh, no restrictions answer? What, which, uh, which slide did you? I have a quiz about Yes. And that study that you were mentioning did not mention nuts. It was corn, popcorn, and nut. here it has seeds. It, it actually, the, the study did cover nuts. It did not cover seeds. Yeah, but in your little quiz box there, it did show seeds. No he, restrictions necessary, right? Yes. Who decided that the seeds Okay to, uh, so yeah, we, I mean, I, study. yeah. So I just elected to show you one study, uh -huh. but there are several studies, and um, consumption of seeds has not been proven. Okay, um, I'm glad to hear that because yeah. seeds are very nice to eat. <laughs> I I still tell my patients in I think in moderation, things are fine, but anything in excess, because theoretically. Um, things like seeds can s possibly get stuck, um, but it hasn't been proven. Yeah. Well, you know, people say don't have seeds when you want to have a hamburger bun that has, you know, I think sesame seeds on top. Yes. You like that, but then you avoid it because that's what you always heard about seeds being you know, yes. Problem with Yes. Yeah, so the comment is should they avoid a patients avoid a sesame seed bun. I think it, that's perfectly fine to have in moderation, in moderation yes. <laughs> what about rosemary and dill? <coughs> what about rosemary and? And dill. Dill. I think those are fine. Those are fine to take. We were just I told, told to I had a friend who mentioned that uh -huh. to avoid problems. To avoid broccoli. So during an acute episode of diverticulitis, we often tell patients to avoid fiber, to avoid residue during the flare-up. But once they recover, then 
food, probably. So right after an acute episode, because you don't want to have foods that can irritate the inflamed area. So we often tell patients to avoid <coughs> high residue foods such as broccoli, cauliflower, asparagus. Um, and, but eventually they should start eating that type of food. Um, okay, I had question. a scan a couple of years ago. You had what? I had a scan sure. a couple of years ago. Yes. They thought there was thyroidicolitis, there was so much gas, they couldn't tell this, they couldn't tell that. Mm -hmm. So my doctor at UCLA, which I have now, she just resigned. Mm -hmm. Anyway, she wanted me to get another scan. She said take gas X for five days, four times a day, and uh, this is supposed to hopefully take the gas out mm -hmm. and then get the scan. Mm -hmm. But she resigned, this thing never happened. Now, I really want to find out what is actually happening. Mm -hmm. Would an ultrasound give me clarification? So um, I think I would need to know more details into what the initial scan showed. Yeah. Um, you're saying it showed di diverticulitis? Um, or Supposedly, but okay. there was... Uh, or did it just show diverticulosis? Yes. So they did a scan, mm -hmm. but uh, due to the tons of gas, mm -hmm. you could see certain things. They couldn't see the pancreas, they couldn't see the pancreas, but supposedly they were still much provided. Okay. Well, the doctor I had, they never discussed it with me, nothing. Uh -huh. I find out that was a doctor at UCLA. Yes. And she decided she would not take the scan. Uh -huh. So we were going to do that, but she was on. The mm -hmm. scan was never done. Mm -hmm. And when it mentioned ultrasound, I know ultrasound is a lot easier. Yeah. So, I mean, if it, one is looking for diverticulitis, CT scan is the best scan. Um, but I think I would need to know more details about what your initial scan showed yeah. to be able to. Um, so, I need an appointment with you and bring your copy of the results? Sure. I mean, I think showing a physician yeah. the sc I actual have scan. Yeah. Because the doctor I had then never discussed anything. And they put me through endless tests oh, yeah. for various things. Mm -hmm. and never discussed anything. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I guess I should. Do you mind asking me? I mean, do you mind if I ask how old are you? <laughs> yeah, I, I, I'll talk you to you afterwards. So I'll talk to you afterwards. <laughs> um, <laughs> any other questions that anyone has? Oh, okay, yes. If you don't take antibiotics, the There's comment is what happens if you don't take antibiotics. So there are in certain instances where patients have a mild episode and like any infection, sometimes your body can fight the infection on its own. Um, but for moderate to severe episodes, I think antibiotics are needed to prevent the complications. Can it make you? It can make the it can make the diverticulitis worse, the infection, which in turn leads to complications. And once you have diverticulosis, there's no way to get out. Once the pockets form, or the or once patient develops diverticulosis, there's no way of getting rid of diverticulosis. Well, how do you keep the situation from getting worse? Though? How, Fiber by the diet, exactly. So you're saying that a poor diet contributed to these diverticulosis pockets in the first place? Yes. Are people like genetically predisposed to it in some cases, or is it strictly your diet that you've had all your life? So the question is is there a genetic predisp predisposition to diverticulosis, or is it just related to diet? So they've done twin studies, and they've discovered that um, monozygotic twins, it's more common in monozygotic twins, which means identical twins uh, compared to dizygotic twins. So um, uh, there is a hereditary component to diverticulosis. It's, it's not only diet, but diet does play a big role. Yes, yes.
Does question. Sugar, sugar? sugar? Yeah, the question is, does sugar trigger any? Um, so act, sugar actually does not have an effect on diverticulosis. It kills you in a bunch of other ways. There's other bad effects, Until they exactly. Mind, <laughs> they the popcorn yeah. So at, I, I don't know if all of you heard in the news um, just a couple days ago, they were talking about processed um, yeah. red, processed yeah. meat and red meat. So the WHO considers processed meat as a carcinogen now. Mm -hmm. And they say there's a 17% risk of uh, colorectal cancer from processed, from, meat. from processed meat. And there is some risk with uh, red meat. <coughs> And so they looked at daily consumption. Um, so I think, it, again, in moderation, it probably should be OK. Um, but daily consumption of processed meat, probably not good. OK. So. Um, the question was, does long-term use of medications like ibuprofen increase the chance of uh, diverticulosis? Um, so it increases the chance of diverticulitis if you have diverticulosis. And then the other comment was, um, can you take ibuprofen if you have diverticulitis? Um, so the answer is, there's, I, I don't know if there's a correct answer. Um, there, if you have a lot of colitis associated with uh, the diverticulitis, then maybe it should be avoided because um, NSAIDs or non-steroidal and anti-inflammatory drugs can um, delay healing or worsen colitis itself. But if it's just the diverticulitis, then it's probably okay. So. Something that it, it's, the question, the comment was, how would you know the difference between diverticulitis and colitis, which is a good question, but often I think that's something for your doctor to, de to determine. But symptoms of colitis generally include um, rectal bleeding and diarrhea. Mm -hmm. Symptoms of diverticulitis generally includes um, pain, more pain. Not, not, patients generally don't have uh, bleeding <coughs> or um, diarrhea. Would there be pain on both the sides of your lower abdomen with diverticulitis or diverticulosis? So you can, yeah, so you can have diverticulosis anywhere through your colon. Mm -hmm. And your colon starts on the right side and goes, you know, around. But most patients have diverticulosis in their sigmoid colon, which is on the left side. So that's the typical presentation where it's on the left. But patients, some occasionally we do see patients with diverticulitis involving the right colon, so it's on the right side. Is that because the diverticulosis is less prevalent in the higher part of the colon and further into the intestines? Yes, so I think the, just the pressure and the intraluminal pressure within the right colon is less. So that's why there's less tendency to form the pockets. Other questions? Good. Thank you. Thanks for all coming. Thank you. Thank you.